what is the situation of clinicians in Ukraine and what can we do to help them? You're listening to Clinical Conversations. I'm Joe Elia, and I'm joined by co-host Ali, Dr. Ali Raja, an emergency physician from Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Our guest was supposed to be Dr. Andre Hook. Uh, he is the chief of Department of uh, Endoscopy and Craniofacial Neuro- Neurosurgery at the Romadonov Neurosurgery Institute in Kiev. However, he's unable to join us because there is a war going on. And so we have been joined by Dr. Roxolana Horbave, um, who is in Philadelphia and has been involved with the American College of Surgeons program on uh, called Stop the Bleed, which is really about trauma and not about uh, the situation in Ukraine right now. But, but here she is with us. And uh, we also have Dr. Uh, uh, Serhi uh, Kareta, a neurologist from the city of Cheniev, uh, who is not in Cheniev right now. He's uh, evacuated to a safer place. So we welcome both of you. And thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you, Dr. Horbeve, Dr. Kareta. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Kareta, it's been- especially given the fact that you just evacuated to Western Ukraine. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like before your evacuation? We know that this has been such a stressful time, but how how are your colleagues doing? How is the hospital? How are the physicians? How are you doing? Well, uh, we discharged most most of the patients that we were able to discharge. And uh, we basically only have those who cannot be discharged. And the hospital receives a lot of trauma and a lot of injured patients from the, you know, from the, from the battlefield, basically. And it's, and it's one of the hospitals. It's not the only hospital that, that receives <clears throat> the injured. It's a large hospital, but uh, the patients that were previously hospitalized, they, they were all gathered on a single floor, which is a ther- therapy department, so all therapeutic specialties, and then uh, another floor for all surgical specialties. And all the other floors of the hospitals and all the other rooms of the hospital were freed for uh, incoming uh, injured patients. So it, it's taking a lot of trauma. It's taking in a lot of trauma patients. Mostly okay. civilians, mostly civilians. The arrangement is that only the critical staff is in the hospital. So we don't have all the physicians, we don't have all the nurses and staff in the hospital. It's just the critical staff, like heads of departments and those on call, you know, and we rotate. Uh, same in the ICU departments. In, uh, which is which is done uh, in case the hospital gets hit, so that uh, we have our personnel preserved and we course. can continue to function. Doctor um, Doctor Raja and I are both based in Boston, uh, and yesterday there were marches here in support of the people of of Ukraine. Could you tell us if we could get clinical supplies to you right now? What would be what supplies would be most valuable to what you are trying to accomplish? I think yes, you can get supplies, but not to all parts of Ukraine. For example, you can probably, most likely, get supplies into Kiev, which is not surrounded, but there is heavy fighting going on uh, north of the city, west, west, north, and east of the city but there are still uh, ways to get into the city. So medical supplies, it's possible to get medical supplies into Kiev. And uh, <clears throat> it may not be possible to get medical supplies into Charity Gift at the moment because it's basically surrounded and, there, and there's heavy fighting going on between Kiev and Charity Gift. So that would be extremely risky. And uh, there are several places in Ukraine that receive most of the refugees and uh, most of the trauma patients, that would be Kiev. And that would be Dnipro, 
which is in the central part of the country, and a, a smaller city of Paltava, which is kind of north and east of Dnipro. And they receive a lot of patients from Kharkiv, which is the worst hit city at the moment. So uh, Kiev, Dnipro, and Poltava, three locations in Ukraine where it is possible to, to get medical supplies to, and those are the places that receive most of the injured patients. Those are the locations, three locations at the moment. And it is possible to get all of those supplies through the western border from Poland, Slovakia, uh, Hungary. I think it's possible, especially Poland, because Poland is, has been really cooperative through all of this, and they're helping a lot. They would, I'm sure they would be happy to, to assist us with any kind of you know, medical line supply line or whatever. Thanks, Dr. Coretta. Dr. Horbove, you're a, you're a surgeon, an intensivist. You're a Ukrainian-American. You've been in and out of the Ukraine for decades working with trauma surgeons, and you've been an advocate for and a leader of the Stop the Bleed program over there. I know you've been in constant touch with a number of physicians in the Ukraine right now. Um, what are they seeing? What are your colleagues seeing? What are they how much has care been disrupted? What have you heard from the folks you know so well? Oh, thank you so much. So, um, yes, uh, I've been also teaching um, the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians course on PHTLS, pre-hospital trauma life support, as well as the DODs, TCCC, all different levels of that since 2014. Um, as well as other courses like RTDC, the Rural Trauma Course and Team, uh, quite intensively um, through 2019, even being there up to six times, two weeks at a time, sometimes. And so it, that's really helped the Ukrainian military, um, along with many other people who have done similar training, you know, it would increase their their skills with, with, with these courses and staying in touch um, with them really hundreds of people, they're continuing to do their work. They're standing for Ukraine. They are very resolved um, that they will win, and we all believe that they will. They give examples, for example, of paratroopers um, being um, deployed from the Belarus area and, and the wind being so strong that rather than them landing in Ukraine, they were blown back into Belarus and um, targets throughout Ukraine that the Russians set for firing and bombing um, got covered with snow. And so there's a, a lot of belief um, in their uh, abilities. And so people, you know, depending on when you, you speak to them, their condition may have changed from yesterday to today. So for example, a um, person, one of our in instructors, a, um, an incredible physician in Vinitia, which is uh, um, quite central and a bit to the west of KU, uh, she's been participating uh, with us in, in instruction and things. And yesterday, you know, it was quiet, right? And then yesterday they bombarded the um, airport. And so the conditions change from moment to moment. And so they're doing their best. They're standing their ways. They are massively overwhelmed. Um, the hospitals, um, I just heard from the Lviv Western Medical Military Center, um, they're doing what they can. Um, so all help, uh, well, at all levels. From the population side, um, tourniquets, um, and I'm very grateful DOD has provided some guidance about improvised tourniquets, which we've now implemented and are, are teaching. We've figured out a, what seems to be a reasonable, effective way to um, create um, and use improvised tourniquets. They are um, in need of Tourniquets, um, all, you know, the first aid, IFEC type of thing, NPAs, um, needles, all reusables. Um, and then for things that are, are um, con not uh, consumables, instruments um, for general surgery and especially vascular surgery and orthopedics. So I've had lists as from all over um, really the country. The, the key things are that I'm always asked for are general surgery instruments, um, the vascular like grafts, eight millimeter by 80 
is is their choice back um, wound dressings um, um, bipolar generators and uh, forceps orthopedic instruments uh, especially x fixes uh, rods uh, pins um, those kind of things because as you know you know bombs um, have not only internal injuries to the, the lungs in all air bearing um, areas uh, but also um, amputations and broken bones and so that has its you know classic um, scenario that needs to be dealt with and as Sir Hayes also said this they're targeting civilians as well as the military and so in 40 million population you know we need a lot of things and when hospitals get bombed then those resources get destroyed and when train lines get disrupted and bombed humanitarian aid is destroyed so but those are the key things vascular ortho general surgery instruments and consumables my suggestion would be that we uh we need to address the basic stuff you know the, the very basic stuff uh, the basic medications antibiotics uh and you know the iv lines you know the basic stuff because they use a lot of that and my other suggestion would be to contact those key hospitals in those key cities of Dnipro and Kiev and probably Poltava. Those are the cities that are receiving most of the trauma patients at the moment and ask them directly exactly what exactly what their need is. So uh, we're not just guessing uh, what may be needed, but uh, we could probably, and I'm sure we would get a very specific list of things of what the actual need is. I'm sorry, I have done that. So the things that I listed for you are the things that have come from those hospitals. The oh, list okay. that I, I actually provided city is from Mikala, who's in Chernihiv. And uh-huh. that's, you know, those are the things that he said that they needed. And there are very similar lists from Kiev. I mean, you know, globally, that's, th- those are, you know, to get it down into four categories, right, is consumables, which is all the basic stuff. Uh, the, the three types of, as, as far as surgery goes, the, those three types of instruments and, you know, the, the items that I listed, those are directly from the KU uh, Trauma Hospital, just the, okay. from Sunday. And that's what we are uh, trying to provide. I'm, I'm also um, the president of the World Federation of Ukrainian Medical Associations here in the U.S. And we have um, a little bit of a global network throughout um uh, the world, um, and we're on a WhatsApp group, and so um, that is helping um, a lot to um, uh, focus the supplies. For example, if someone needed a certain a drug for multiple sclerosis in Kiev at the um, uh, Oblast Center there um, on Saturday when it was yet uh, calm, or Friday or Saturday. And so from Switzerland, we were able to, or, or Greece, I think, Greece, we were able to get that within a day or two. So we are constantly honing in on needs that we know because we're in constant communication with people who can still um, you know, have access to communication. And, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Carreta, I, I wanted to ask you about the morale of the staff. It, it's, it, <laughs> there's a lot of fighting spirit there. That's people, are not, people are not giving up. No, no, no. No, so good. no way. People are just, uh, people are, uh, people expect to uh, fight until, until this is over. Yes. Are, are, are people getting sleep, food? Oh, you, uh, oh, um, well, you kind of get used to it. <laughs> I, uh, we actually had some, some of this trouble waking up some of the staff in the middle of the embarkment uh, six or five days after this started <laughs> and we had to roll them over and tuck them under beds if we couldn't take them to the basement <laughs> so uh well you know yeah but, but well but 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 uh there is uh going to be a humanitarian catastrophe in those cities that are surrounded this is true and there's already a lot of strain in the city in such places like Chernigov or Sumy which is on the east which is way east of the country or Kharkiv 
Uh, this is becoming a real problem. There is a shortage of food and there is a shortage of basic medical supplies, basic things like uh, flu medicines, antibiotics, uh, you, know, you know, the very basic stuff. There's already a shortage of that in the cities that are on the front line or those are those that are surrounded. So there is a brewing humanitarian catastrophe in, in, in that part of the country. And it's only a matter of days before it gets, before it gets really bad. I just wanted to, we just wanted to ask about how we can help. We have an audience of of many, many clinicians from around the country and from around the world, all of many of whom are looking to help and some of whom already are, but many of whom are looking for ways to help. We've talked about donating medical supplies and Dr. Horbeve, whatever you think in terms of the contact information, we'll post that with the podcast. What else can all of the clinicians around the world listening to this podcast do to help you? How can we help? Uh, if I may, I suppose we need a single body that would collect all those things and then somebody distributing it on site, depending on the needs in specific places and, and not just random donations here and there. So I can speak from the U.S. We are um, scurrying and have scurried and are really, I think, um, so he wouldn't know this, quite organized. There are several major um, NGOs and um, professional organizations that are Ukrainian and including the ACS who are in close communications, who are constantly being updated with needs. There are shippers in place that ship humanitarian aid from the U.S. to Ukraine to Poland, which is where, you know, we've been able to, to, to ship most. Um, some were trying to shipping to Kiev. I don't know if that's possible now. We are, you know, organized and we, and, you know, there have been um, an outpouring of um, support from all sorts of community members, clinicians, everything. So said, hey, please know that it's not just what someone thinks or makes up or, you know, because I mean, from where you are, you may not, may not know, but the information is right for right now, at least, you know, is, is flowing. And other countries have offered the, sh the shipments as well. So not only like Nova Pochta is here and Mist is here and um, Nip Nipra, which is the name of a shipping company that are, these are traditional uh, shippers, right? Um, there are other non-Ukrainian shippers that have stepped up uh, and, um, and the Ukrainians are steadfastly resolved. And so we're just pulling all the stops, all the plugs, to push anything that we can. Clinicians and everyone can very much do in addition to providing, you know, those things that I've listed. And I'm, I'm glad to share the um, Ministry of Health's um, needs list um, w uh, with you. I will, I, will, uh, I will post that, Dr. Harbave, uh, with, with this podcast. Uh, yeah, if I may, a, a very important thing that everyone can do, and I think when something that could be incredibly effective and has been helpful, is to remember to we're, we're trying to stop the carnage, and that is to lobby for stop the oil, and provide a new fly zone, provide uh, the, <laughs> the lethal defensive military aid that you know Ukrainians so much need because theirs just gets destroyed as well and consumed, you know. Um, and so, and so that, you know, anyone can do, but that is, that's so critically important. A no-fly zone over Ukraine is extremely important and it's really urgent because that's where most of the carnage comes from. We want to thank you, Dr. Horbeve and, and Dr. Coretta for, for being with us. And I hope this interview will bring help where it's needed. Uh, Dr. Coretta, especially, I want to applaud you and your staff for your bravery against uh, the Russian invasion. That was our 284th clinical conversation that comes to you from the NEJM group and the writers and editors of NEJM Journal Watch. The executive producer is Kristen Kelly. I'm Joe Elia. And I'm Ali Raja. Thanks for listening. And more importantly, thank you for doing what you can to help the brave clinicians in the Ukraine taking care of their people.